I will start just by telling you all a little bit about myself. Again, my name is Dr. Heron. I use she, her pronouns. I am an orthopedic and pelvic health physical therapist. I practice at Northwest Wellness right here in Federal Way, about um, like just five minutes south, eh, let's be honest, seven minutes south of Marlene's, close enough that I can sneak up to their juice bar and get a smoothie during my lunch break. And um, anyways, I earned my Bachelor of Arts from Colorado College. I uh, majored in cellular molecular biology and double minored in kinesiology and Spanish. I also was a student athlete in college, so I bring with me um, that lens into you know, every patient encounter I have as an orthopedic PT and also as a public health PT. And then I earned my doctor in physical therapy from Pacific University outside of Portland area. And there I completed my final capstone on primary dysmenorrhea, which is a fancy way of saying menstrual distress. So um, a condition where folks have more severe periods that can be pretty debilitating and stuff. And then I also had a really wonderful opportunity to complete a research project with community members who were suffering from urinary incontinence or bladder leakage. And those are just a couple of things that kind of spiked my interest in pelvic health PT. And then after I graduated, I decided to become certified as a uh, level one physical therapist through the Herman and Wallace Pelvic Rehab Institute. And that brings me to what my pelvic health clinical expertises are now. So some conditions that folks experience that I work with often include uh, pelvic pain. So that can include things like vaginismus, like a, a tightening of the pelvic muscles or tenderness to the pelvic muscles. So those muscles right in our saddle area, that area where we kind of would sit on a saddle, our inner groin area. Also pelvic organ prolapse, which I'll go into a little bit more later, or if you had a chance to read the article that Marlene's let me post in their magazine, you may have gotten some insight into that. And then I work a lot with folks who are trying to optimize their peripartum health. So pregnancy related symptoms, this could include low back pain during pregnancy, um, your uh, bladder leakage that comes on during pregnancy, um, really anything related to pregnancy, even just simply trying to exercise safely during pregnancy, and then also supporting people to try to decrease risk of complications such as tearing during vaginal deliveries related to pregnancy. And then I already mentioned primary dysmenorrhea. The three conditions that I'm going to focus on today include bladder leakage, overactive bladder, and then painful sexual intercourse. Okay, and then getting a little bit more into the discussion today, I'm going to give you all a roadmap of where we're going to start and we, where we will finish up. So because we're talking about our pelvic region, which I, I always approach it assuming that not everyone knows everything that we're talking about. And I find it's really helpful for my patients to go a little bit into anatomy because this is an area where some people um, just don't know a lot about it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the pelvic girdle. Um, so the bones and the joints that make up the pelvic girdle, the pelvic floor muscles, uh, pelvic organs. And then I will review external genitalia, our private parts, right? And it is worth noting this presentation is primarily is targeted towards folks who are assigned female at birth. So it might be helpful for folks who have not been assigned female at birth, but are trying to figure out how to support a loved one who has been. I will then go into um, the five main functions of the pelvic floor, and we'll finish off talking about how physical therapy can support folks experiencing those three main conditions of overactive bladder, bladder leakage, or painful sexual intercourse. We're gonna save some time at the end, about 10 minutes for Q and A. Um, however, I encourage all of you to send any messages to Elizabeth, our lovely host, um, during our presentation. She's gonna flag me down so that I can pause and go into a little bit more detail. Um, and I just, I wanna make sure that everyone, that we're all speaking the same language as we go through this. And um, she is going to bring those questions up anonymously if you would like. And again, you can also unmute yourself and uh, interrupt me with those questions. I love questions. Okay, my hopes for today's presentation, one of them, well, there's a lot, but one of them is to bust the myth that Kegels are the solution to every pelvic floor dysfunction. And then I hope that everyone who watches this feels a little bit more empowered to begin talking about any pelvic health symptoms they may be considering and then um, seeking uh, support and help for those symptoms. Okay, so let's get into some anatomy here. 
on the left side of your screen, you're looking at the front of a pelvis. So if you and I were standing facing each other, this is the view you would have of my pelvis. Up top here, if you follow, follow my little mouse thing, is your L3 vertebra. So this whole region here is your lumbar spine. You've got L3, L4, and L5. The lumbar spine sits on top of, oh, I see Elizabeth, looks like you're about to get out, take some notes. This, that looks, that's great. Yay. Um, sits on top of the sacrum, which is oftentimes called our triangle bone. And then down here, this like pink, I don't know, is that fuchsia? This little baby bone at the bottom, that's your cossacks or your tailbone. If we go out to the side, you've got these fan shaped big bones, which are our hip bones. Okay. And then those come together up front to close the pelvic girdle. That's why it's called the pelvic girdle. And right here is your pubic symphysis this really important joint in that impacts our entire pelvic region. This is a common area that um, athletes who especially do a lot of like cutting sports, like gymnasts, lacrosse players, soccer players, sometimes experience pain. It's also an area that uh, just expands amazingly and dramatically during pregnancy. So it's not uncommon for folks who are pregnant to experience some pain right in this region. And then down on the bottom here, this green shaped one, and then a matching one on the other side, those are your sit bones. And then lastly here, this orange bone is your femur or your thigh bone. Now I'm gonna direct you um, to the right side of the screen. So up, up front here, this is the front of the person. And then this is the back of the person. We have the pubic bone, which is the same area right here. And then we've got the sacrum, the back of the spine over here. In between that, we have these really beautiful pelvic organs, our bladder, where we store urine, the uterus, where a baby can be made, and then the bowel, where our poop or feces travels through to exit out of the anus. This little tiny line here represents the urethra, which is the little hose where urine exits from the bladder, and then this is the vaginal canal. This pink hammock-shaped structure right here represents our pelvic floor muscles. So we're gonna go into that more, but I wanna pause this and just walk us through kind of identifying these bony landmarks on our own body. So if you're able to, I'll ask you to take one of your hands and feel down the back, the center of your low back, okay? When you get to that kind of like the boniest aspect, then you're on the back of your spine. If you're close to like the edge of the top of your pants, you're already right in that region of like L4, L5. If you walk your hands down a little bit lower, then you're gonna hit your sacrum. Yep, and if you're, if you're doing it like me, then you'll probably find you had to scooch forward a little bit on your chair so you can feel everything, right? Now, if you take your hands and just go around the edge of your hips, okay, you're gonna find the fan-shaped hip bones and stuff. And then I will have you take your hand, find your belly button, now, for warning, we're about to walk right over the bladder. So if you have a full bladder or you have any urge to pee, I recommend you press kind of gently. And you're going to walk your fingers down your belly, underneath your belly button, pressing in you know, gently or firmly until you hit a firmer area. As soon as you, you move from that softer tissue to something that feels soft and then it feels hard, you're on the pubic bone, this area right here. And the pubic bone on most people is, is like about this thick. So it's a pretty wide area. And then lastly, what I'll have you do is take your hand, place it under your right or left butt cheek. And when you feel the boniest aspect, that those are your sit bones, okay? Um, so now we're kind of oriented to our own body. And then you can also think about how within your body, the bladder is up front, the uterus is sandwiched in between the bladder and the bowel. And what I love about this image on the right here is it does a really good job representing just how close everything is together. So this is part of why if you've ever been pregnant or known someone who's been pregnant and talking about how they got to pee all the time or like baby kicked and then they have to pee, it's because as this uterus expands and stuff, it sometimes can gently press into the bladder. And then also, if you've ever been constipated and had a hard time going poop, you may have noticed that sometimes that also matches with when you have low back pain. And that can be because the spowel is so close to this part of your spine and there's this really cool nerve bundle right in between. And so depending on how well um, food is moving through our system and stuff, that can directly impact our low back health. All right. Doo -doo -doo. So 
here is a bottom view of the pelvis. I want to provide this to y'all because everything in our body is three dimensional. So let's let's take a look at it from this view. To orient you, here is the back of the person down here. And then up top is the front of the person, which means that this is the pubic symphysis, that pubic bone where you walked your fingers down to. Way off on the side here, those are those fan-shaped hip bones. Okay. And then right here and matching right on the other side, those are the sit bones, the part where you're sitting on. So this is commonly the view, right, that a gynecologist has when they're doing an internal exam. It's also the view that I get to have when I happen to do an internal pelvic floor exam with my patients. Right here is the tailbone, and you can start to see, like appreciate the intricacy of all the pelvic floor muscles. There's 14 different ones split up into three different layers. They all have different functions. And this right here, the external anal sphincter is the one that goes around the anus. Again, that's the hole where poop comes out of. And then up here, you can start to see the muscles that support the vaginal canal, and then the urethra right here where P exits, and then way up here, the clitoris. All right, one more view of the pelvic floor muscles. So now, thank you for the oh cool. I, I can't hear you, Elizabeth, but I saw it with your lips. So this is a bird's eye view. Um, and I like this view a lot because um, it does a good job of representing, like to me, this almost looks like a bull. And that's what I tell my patients is, it's really like our pelvic floor muscles are so cool. They're like the MVPs of our body, I feel like, but also, um, it, they're, they're kind of like this bottom aspect of this big bowl, the bowl being our pelvis. And these outer muscles here are our pelvic, the, the muscles that make up the walls of our pelvic floor. And they really are equally important in our pelvic health function. And if these muscles are tight or if there's pain in them, that can impact our ability to control when we urinate, to have bowel movements, to participate in sexual intercourse, to, to deliver a baby, all those things. But again, here's the sacrum back here. Then you've got the opening for the anus. This is the opening for where the vagina sits, um, the opening to the vagina, and then the urethra as well. Okay, so pelvic floor muscles, I told you all they were split into three different layers. I'm going to talk first about layer one and layer two. Um, the layers, uh, layer one is the most superficial one. So this is like, by that I mean it's the outermost layer. Um, the main functions of layer one and layer two include um, bladder control. Um, they also provide a lot of support to the vagina. Uh, they also serve as attachment sites to several other muscles. Um, specifically, this area right here, okay, this is called the perineal body. This is the area that sits in between the opening to the vaginal canal and also the opening for the anus. This is the area where sometimes during uh, delivery, there can be complications. There can be um, a little bit of tearing here, or a doctor may decide to, with the patient to create a small incision here, just to create a little bit more opening for the child as they come out of the vagina. Um, but this is just such an important area. There's a re it's a really like strong area and stuff. Um, and it happens to serve as the attachment site for the majority of, the, of our pelvic floor muscles. So you can imagine if this is the attachment site, if there's any injury to this area, whether it's during a delivery or whether it's during a sexual assault or a moment of sexual abuse, this can really impact the entirety of the pelvic floor region. Um, and as, as we're kind of getting into, you can see how the pelvic floor muscles are the bottom of our entire core, abdomen, organ area and stuff. So if these aren't really functioning optimally, it can really um, impact the rest of our spine health and the rest of our body health. Layers one and two play a big role in sexual function too. One of my favorite muscles on the body, mostly because I think the name is really cool, um, ischiocavernosis here. Um, that's this muscle right here. And then it comes down on this side as well. That's the muscle responsible for pumping blood up to the clitoris right here. So the muscle that's largely responsible for ability to orgasm and playing a role in the type of orgasms folks have, the quality, the length, all of those things. Okay, that brings us to layer three of the pelvic floor, which is sometimes called the pelvic diaphragm. This is the layer that oftentimes gets a lot of the press. Um, the, some of the main functions of this uh, layer of the pelvic floor muscles include fecal continence. So 
controlling um, when we go poop. Also our ability to um, prevent gas from coming out in social situations when we don't want it to. It also really lifts the pelvic floor. So this one does a, it does a big job in supporting those pelvic organs. Remember the bladder, the uterus and the bowel. It also uh, plays a big role in resisting what we call increased intra-abdominal pressure. So increased intra-abdominal pressure, that's what happens when we like kind of hold our breath. If you take a big breath and go, and you notice that like tightens up all the muscles in your abdomen and stuff. This is commonly what happens if folks aren't really engaging their core muscles, but their, their body is craving support and stability. So we increase that intra-abdominal pressure and stuff when we lift up something heavy, for example. It also happens um, reflexively when we cough, when we sneeze. And so what we find is that if this muscle, if the layer, the muscles in this layer aren't doing like a kick butt job of supporting everything and resisting that increased pressure, the pressure then can kind of push into, oh, excuse me, would you look at that? My mom is calling me. Anyways, the, uh, the, the increased pressure can push into um, the bladder and then contribute to bladder leakage. This is kind of why we're getting into uh, when people cough or sneeze and they're like, oh shoot, I'm peeing my pants and stuff. Um, so this, this layer um, plays a role in that. And then the second layer is also the main layer responsible for tightening up to close the hose where our urine exits. So again, that's that urethra that is connected to the bladder and comes out. A couple more fun facts. Um, so this is the layer where if we were to be a, um, a, a living being that had a tail, uh, this is the muscle, this pink one is the muscle that would wag our tail, kind of comes down to the bottom part of our tailbone. Um, and then this, the, the, this layer plays a big role in sexual function too. Now, why am I going so much into the different layers of the pelvic floor? Well, I think it's really significant because when I perform, get to perform an internal pelvic floor muscle exam, if that's something patients are comfortable with, what I tell them is that I'm looking at the function of every layer of your pelvic floor muscle. And I think this is different than most people's experiences when they go to a gynecologist, where oftentimes the intention there is to you know, maybe do a pap smear and stuff, look to see if there's any, um, you know, any risk of like cancer or something like that going on and just like a general overview of the, of the vulva and the vagina and stuff. But what I do as I insert my finger into a patient, we can really uh, um, approximate which layer we're at based on how far my finger is inserted. And you can do this yourself as well. So as I perform an internal exam, what I tell patients is I'm gonna insert my finger like about a centimeter, kind of up to like my first knuckle here. And that brings us to about the first layer of the pelvic floor. Then if I go about to my second knuckle, that brings us to the second layer. And almost to the third one, though I have longer fingers, so I always modify a little bit, but that brings us to the diaphragm. And as we insert to different depths within the vaginal canal, and I ask patients to do different things like try a pelvic floor contraction, try to bear down. How about, um, can you cough for me? And we just observe what's going on with those pelvic floor muscles. That can give us some really specific information on how well they're functioning. And then we can compare that to any symptoms someone is experiencing, like if they sneeze and cough and urine leaks, or if they have pain during sex, um, and just kind of bring all the information together so we can really personalize your care. Okay, remember when we were looking at that one slide that was like the bird's eye view, and I mentioned, I started talking about how the pelvis is kind of like a bowl, and I mentioned the pelvic floor, the muscles that make up the wall of the pelvic floor. So we're gonna highlight just a couple of those right now. This one right here is the obturator internus. And then we have this one out here, which is the piriformis. The piriformis is one, if you've ever had physical therapy and you've had back pain or hip pain and um, someone like myself has taken their elbow and gently or maybe not so gently um, pressed it into your glute region, um, they may have been working on this muscle because this muscle um, plays a big role. And uh, if it's really tight, it can cause back pain, hip pain. It's also a muscle that goes over the sciatic nerve. So if you've had um, you know, sciatica or numbness tingling down your legs before, this muscle is oftentimes a player in those symptoms. And then um, both of these muscles, if they're tight, can influence the tightness of the other pelvic floor muscles. So for people who have um, pain during intercourse or pain inserting things like a tampon into the vaginal canal, um, 
that it can be really significant to do some soft tissue work on these muscles to release them a little bit or teach patients how to do that themselves so that then you don't have that tissue restriction, that tightness happening of the vaginal canal when trying to insert objects into it. Okay, we made it to the vulva, yay. So we've gone over uh, the bones a little bit. We've gone over uh, the muscles a little bit. I mean, it's pretty complex, this I know, but now we're like zooming out to the, the surface area of the skin and stuff. And this is actually um, one of the first things I take a look at with patients during an internal exam. It's just looking over the skin, looking for any signs of you know, redness, tissue irritation and stuff, because our skin health, this is our, this is our barrier and stuff. It's so impactful on our pelvic health. I'm gonna orient you. So down here is the bottom of pelvis. So we've got our, our butt cheeks right here. Up top, you've got where that, that pubic symphysis, that pubic bone would be, the belly would be right up in this region. Okay, and then up top here, we've got the clitoris again. That brings us down to the urethra where P exits. That brings us to the opening to the vagina. And then this represents the anus. Which remember, this is called the perineum, but this is the area between the anus and the vaginal canal where the per perineal body sits right underneath. That's that really thick facet of tissue that's important and so many muscles connecting to it. Also, so now we get to start to appreciate the other tissue in the vulva region. So our labia majora, those are the outermost lips of the, the area to the vaginal canal. Um, it's worth noting that there's so much beautiful diversity in these. It really looks different on every individual. They've actually, um, you'll hear a lot of pelvic health PTs talking about how the diversity in the labia majora and the labia minora is as diverse as all of our faces are and what our noses look like and our eyes look like, very, very different. Um, and it's really important for me to say that because um, I, I hear so often from people that you know, depending on what is represented of our vulva region in TV, uh, media, magazines, porn, different things like that, it can really impact people's uh, ability to connect to their pelvic floor areas or feeling like there's something wrong with them. This doesn't look like what all the other girls' um, vulvas looked like in the gym. And, you know, I just, I just wanna take a moment to say that everyone really looks different. And just because your vulva may look different, if you've ever even looked at it, not a lot of people have, doesn't mean that there's anything unhealthy about it or that there's any, anything innately wrong with it. But, so the labia majora, that's, those are the lips where you will find pubic hair. And then the labia minora are the inner lips to that where usually they are hairless. And then within there, so those layers are protecting the urethra and the vaginal opening. Okay, we made it to the clitoris. Um, I'm pretty sure I cannot take credit for this. Someone must have come up with this, but I was recently like thinking the clitoris to me, it just makes so much sense to consider it as like an iceberg because there's so much more to it than meets the eye. And what, by that, what I mean, is that the clitoris, we've kind of, I've mentioned it on a few slides, right? So it's often this like tiny little piece of tissue that sticks out. But really, when you look at the anatomy of the clitoris, it extends all the way down far past the vaginal opening. Now, that's part of why um, this entire area, of, like your saddle area, can be so sensitive. Though it is worth noting that so one of the um, things I work with is not just uh, like folks coming in and saying, hey, I'm having pain during intercourse. It can also be people coming in and saying, you know, I'm just having difficulty achieving orgasm or I went to a doctor and they told me that um, it's just because I'm too stressed and I'm you know, too anxious and I should just take some anxiety medication right before I, I want to participate in sexual intercourse or something like that, or I just feel like I can't orgasm with penetration. Well, actually, like less than 25% of people with vaginal canals do orgasm simply with penetration. And I oftentimes um, encourage patients to, um, when we're talking about um, assessing like the sensitivity of your pelvic floor region, and now that can be on a spectrum. It can be, hey, I'm having kind of pain. Everything is really, really sensitive. Light pressure is, is painful. And there can be on the spectrum of like, I just don't really feel much of anything going on down here. And so really just become it like building that relationship with you and your pelvic floor to see what different areas are sensitive to you. And, you know, a, a simple tip I'll give people is, for example, if someone shares like, 
maybe they use a vibrator during sexual intercourse because that's something that supports them in their sexual health and their sexual pleasure and their ability to, to achieve orgasm. And oftentimes a lot of folks are concentrated to this clitoris, right? It's kind of like, like the, the third layer of the pelvic floor muscles, but this is the area that gets all the press too, right? This is the spot everyone is talking about. But I also encourage people to start exploring this area on this side, all the way down beyond the vaginal canal, because those tissues are extremely sensitive because the body of the clitoris is running down beyond it, just like an iceberg. Okay, so I've kind of been touching on all of these um, throughout this presentation thus far, but the, um, if, if you were like someone on the street was to stop me and say, hey, what are the five main functions of a pelvic floor? I'd say, hey, it is to um, support our pelvic organs and um, to also support our body. They, again, they're the bottommost aspect of everything. So um, if they are a little bit weak or they have a little bit more um, mobility in them, they're not gonna do the best job supporting. And also if we just have um, a harder time connecting with our pelvic floor muscles, like asking them to do a pelvic floor contraction and feeling like, well, I don't really know if a contraction is happening or not, that can impact their ability to support us. Um, they're sphincteric. That means that they, they close around things. So that's referencing to the urethra um, and also the anus. So our ability to control when we go pee, poop, or pass gas. They have a huge impact in our sexual function. They also offer us a ton of stability. So, you know, as again, as an orthopedic PT, I've always approached things from, hey, someone comes in with back pain, for example, well, um, maybe they have back pain because they're in their back muscles are super tight. That commonly happens because um, back muscles are trying to compensate for us. They're trying to do all the work. We pick up something heavy and our back muscles clamp down to try to give our spine the support and stability it's craving. So let's take a look at those core muscles and see how well they're, they're joining into the game. Are they helping out at all? Um, trust me, I still look at core muscles and stuff when we're looking at pelvic health concerns, but um, the other amazing thing is that the pelvic floor muscles, when they are functioning optimally, they actually couple so well with our deep core muscles that they really um, optimize the ability of our spine to feel really nice and supported and stable. And then lastly, they have this sump pump function. What does that mean? Well, that refers to um, if you yourself or a loved one has ever been in the hospital and they've said things like, make sure you do some ankle pumps, like gas pedal your feet up and down and stuff. We don't, we wanna prevent you from getting like a blood clot or something like that. Well, they say that because, um, you know, veins, the, the, the vessel that's responsible for returning blood back up to our heart and stuff, they, were, they do that based on this like pump system and stuff. Um, so just like, you know, getting moving is, is great for our, our heart health and all those things, our pelvic floor muscles, there's a really intricate um, blood vessel system in that region. And so our ability um, to use our pelvic floor muscles, um, whether or not they're super tight and kind of clamp down or stuff, that impacts our overall blood supply, health, and all those things. Um, and then lastly, they play a big role in our posture and breathing. If our pelvic floor muscles are strong, they've got good endurance, um, that can help us um, sit up a little bit straighter, sit with more neutral spine and stuff. And then um, breathing is super cool. Um, just like um, when we take a big breath, right, and our chest expands a little bit, um, our pelvic floor muscles are actually intended to kind of drop down just gently when we inhale because everything is expanding. And then they sometimes lift up a little bit when we exhale and squeeze air out. On most people, what I find is that there's really minimal movement of the pelvic floor region um, during breath work because that's something we just never focused on. Um, but this is something that can be so amazing for people who have any type of pelvic health symptoms, um, especially people who are pregnant and are preparing for um, delivery because the ability to lift your pelvic floor muscles, AKA contract them or lower them down with control and relax them can be really significant when you're trying to deliver a child. Like, you know, we want to everything to gently expand and open. So there's less chance of tearing and stuff. Um, so developing that connection where you can control if those pelvic muscles are expanding out or not versus contracting and lifting up can make a vaginal delivery easier. And then additionally, um, just like any other body part, like if you came to me and said, hey, I'm, I'm having some shoulder pain. One of the first things you've probably done yourself has been like, oh, I can't like, what's going on? I can't wash my hair. Like I can't lift my shoulder over my head. I can't um, 
put my arm back in my jacket or something. So you yourself have kind of looked into the range of motion of the shoulder joint. And what impacts that is not only the joint deep in there, but also all the muscles that attach to the shoulder joint. So the ability of our pelvic floor muscles to lift up or go down, whether it's um, while we're you know, synchronized with our breath or not, is essentially our ability to assess the natural range of motion of that region. Um, and just like if your knee is stiff and you found that gently riding a bike or something helps with that stiffness, because we say motion is lotion and stuff. Well, it's the same thing with our pelvic um, floor muscles. The difference is there's not every muscle in our body can we move just by simply taking a breath. So that's one thing pelvic health PTs do is guide patients through how to recognize when their pelvic floor muscles are moving, when they're doing a contraction, when they're relaxing it, um, and then how to do that regularly throughout your day um, to just manage whatever symptoms you are having. Okay, man, that's a lot of information. Um, if you've made it this far, a uh, really good job, because I just gave you like a crash course of all anatomy and stuff um, of the pelvic floor region. So that brings us to talking about um, one of the three main conditions that I'm gonna go over today. It's a lot of great information. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for saying that. I really, yeah. I really appreciate it's, that. It's very interesting and just wonderful to learn. I'm 61 and had a hysterectomy and I'm enjoying this very much. Thank you. Oh, well, I think you can see my smile, but that, um, that really, it was like getting like a, like a caffeine shot for the rest of this presentation, but not a caffeine shot that's going to be a bladder irritant and make me have to go pee. That is something else we might talk about at the end is bladder irritants, because it's amazing the uh, links between what we put in our body and how that impacts our bladder health too. Uh, so thank you, Brenda. Okay. Over thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, and remember, folks, you can interrupt me anytime with questions too. I promise I will get, I'll just get right back into my role. Um, okay, overactive bladder. So what is that? Um, I feel like uh, most people experience this. It's funny. I, I definitely had this when I was playing college soccer in large part because um, they call it um, in the pelvic health PT, we refer to it as like going just in case, which most of us probably experienced growing up, right? Like I know my mom was like, do you need to go pee because we're going to go run errands and I don't want you to have to go or I'm um, traveling for college soccer. It was like if the bus stopped and someone had to go, the coaches were like, well, you better all go because we don't want to keep stopping on this 13 hour drive over to Kansas or something. Um, and then this, this has really impacted us right now during the pandemic, because with public restrooms closing and stuff, I, I've heard from so many patients how um, stressful it's been when you have an overactive bladder, meaning you have to go so often, but then all of a sudden, like you can't go to the bathroom, which sometimes impacts people in the sense like maybe you don't want to leave your house because what are you going to do when you have to go pee, right? Um, but anyways, so overactive bladder simply refers to going pee too often during the day or night. Usually there's a really strong urge to go pee. Sometimes they're just so strong the folks can't make it to the bathroom in time. So let's like zoom back into anatomy for a second. So what we're referring to here is that um, the second layer of the pelvic floor muscle is the one that really closes the urethra. The urge is so strong to go. Think of like, um, like a river current coming and stuff. Um, I sometimes say it's like, um, you know, in, in my treatment room, it's like if there was a flood going on in the other room, like how your pelvic floor muscles is like the door closing to this room and your ability is, are, can you close the door quick enough and strong enough to stop the water out there from coming into this room? AKA peeing your pants. Um, so then what are healthy bladder habits? Because how do you know, like, well, I don't know if I go pee too often. Well, um, so generally speaking, going pee seven to nine times a day or every two hours is kind of what we're, we're targeting. A lot of people are kind of more in that like nine to 15 times a day or sometimes 20 plus times a day. So those are frequencies that I would consider as being having an overactive bladder. Um, and then also going to pee um, zero to one times at night is kind of that healthy target. Um, a lot of people end up going pee two to five times at night. So that would also be considered overactive bladder. Um, and the other thing worth noting is that um, if I take out my little bladder thing here, um, so the bladder is a muscle just like any other part of our body. It's actually called the, the detrusor muscle. Um, it's, not a, it's not a huge organ in any of us, but oftentimes with overactive bladder, um, you may have experienced this yourself. It's like, 
you had this strong, you had a strong urge to go, but then maybe you get to the bathroom and you actually only like tinkled a little bit or sometimes stronger to go. And it was like a waterfall happening. Um, and then other times like just peed for a few seconds. So just because you, you go to the bathroom frequently, doesn't necessarily mean that your bladder was actually full. And in pelvic health PT, we talk about um, different triggers that cause us to think we have to go to the bathroom or give us that physical urge to go to the bathroom and then how to manage that so that we don't have to go to the bathroom so often. Um, who's in, uh, affected by this? Um, about one in four people. So it's, it's, it's quite a few people. Bladder leakage, okay. Um, so stress incontinence is when urine uh, bladder, yeah, urine leaks um, during moments of, again, that increased intra-abdominal pressure. I've mentioned this earlier. So that's like when you um, sneeze or cough, but it can also be um, laughing, um, jumping, lifting, um, car carrying your child or something, picking a kid up off the ground. Um, you just spend time around that friend that is so hilarious. They just keep cracking jokes and stuff. And that can really impact the quality of life when you feel like you can't laugh anymore because um, you might pee your pants. Um, common causes of this. Um, so this is where a lot of people are like, oh, I'm leaking urine. I better do some Kegels. But that would include, that would represent like pelvic floor muscle weakness. Um, and I would say that is pretty common, though the other thing, and this is getting into busting the myth of why Kegels are the solution to everything, is because... Um, a Kegel itself, what it actually refers to is like, um, I wanted to say way back in the day, but the truth is, I don't know the date of this. And, um, <laughs> but when they invented Kegels, it was referring to um, this device that would be inserted into the vaginal canal. And it gave people feedback of like how well they were contracting their pelvic floor muscles. When they found out that device was too expensive or inaccessible for most people, they ended up um, making these pamphlets, right? That were often given out in like birthing facilities to, to people assigned female at birth saying like, hey, you should like do these Kegels to support your pregnancy and stuff. Um, and then turns out like most people who just get like a description of doing a Kegel are actually doing it incorrectly, actually doing like a bearing down motion. That's where you like push out your pelvic floor muscles, which actually promotes it, um, bladder leakage more so than doing a pelvic floor contraction. But anyways, um, so what I walk people through is learning a, a contraction, but also learning like a quick contraction versus a slow contraction, and then an ability to lift up your pelvic floor muscles and hold them for two seconds versus five seconds versus 10 seconds. And um, kind of like just an ability to coordinate your pelvic floor muscles um, so that they can do more than one thing. Because we, like I've talked about so many different functions so far, we need our pelvic floor muscles to do a ton of different things. Some of the things are um, reflexive, just like breathing. We don't really think about it usually, but other things like we want to be able to control. For example, like if you know that you um, experience bladder leakage sometimes, wouldn't it be great to know how to contract your pelvic floor muscles quickly because you just sense that tickle coming in your nose and you saw a little tornado of like pollen go by and you know you're about to sneeze. So if you can do a quick pelvic floor contraction that's strong enough, you can save yourself sometimes from having that bladder leakage. Um, but this is a really common thing. Um, over 15 million adults assigned female at birth are uh, right now impacted by stress incontinence. Okay, painful intercourse. Um, three out of four people with vaginas experience this at some point during their lifespan. I think this is so important. I think we should still be talking about this more. Um, the three most common symptoms that I hear patients um, report about regarding painful intercourse includes um, pain with, I'm going to use my dilator here as a little demo. So if, if my fingers here make like the opening to the vaginal canal. So pain with initial penetration here, um, and then pain with deep thrust, like a feeling of something kind of jamming up against something, usually one of your pelvic organs, or a burning or friction sensation during intercourse. Um, some common physical therapy treatments for all of this, um, include um, pelvic floor relaxation training. So that's, I, I mentioned that with like breath work and stuff, but basically if we, if we look at the pelvic floor muscles, generally speaking, I refer to it as like, there's the spectrum. Over here is like, um, they're a little, maybe they're a little tighter. Um, over here is like, maybe they are uh, a little less tight, but also over here, maybe um, they're a little bit more sensitive. Maybe over here, there's a little less sensation. Um, 
And depending on where you're on the spectrum, it doesn't mean that just because they're tight, that doesn't mean they're strong. And just because they're less tight doesn't mean they're weak. Sometimes they can be really tight and weak and they can be have a little bit more movement to them, but be super strong. It's so personalized on each person, which again, I think I think that's why pelvic health PT is so cool because it's like, it's like going to do a physical on your body, one that you've never had. I don't know why we grow up when we go to physicals like yearly, if you have, if you're, you know, privileged and have access to healthcare, but most of us um, didn't grow up going and getting a, um, a physical of our pelvic floor muscles, just checking in on the function of them. But um, another thing that we commonly do is um, dilator therapy. So I have a few of these here. This is my favorite brand. It's called um, Intimate Rose. I like this brand because, um, they are made from like a material that's really soft um, and, a, and it's a flexible. It's a lot more comfortable in vaginal canals compared to other brands that are kind of, um, my patients always, I, I give them both brands and I'm like, can you feel that? Which one would you prefer to insert into your vaginal canal? And they were like, oh, definitely not that other one. That's like sticky and it feels like, feels like it would like friction or like, like a ripping sensation. I'm like, yes, unfortunately that's kind of a, the common ones that are like sold in most stores. And unfortunately, a lot of people, when they go to a gynecologist and they're recommended dilator therapy, they don't really receive custom information on like one, what type of dilator to get for them and also what size. Uh, I work with, with Intimate Rose, they have eight different sizes and like this is size one right here and this is size eight. Um, and so someone who's really more appropriate for size one, but goes and buys a size eight, this can be so intimidating. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, using this when this is really more appropriate for you, you can imagine how painful that would be. Um, and it can it can make participating in dilator therapy just like, like, why would someone want to do that when it's painful? It's really not supposed to be painful. Um, and then the other thing, I mean, really, I'm just giving the surface here, y'all, because um, it, it talking about sexual intercourse is such a complex thing to get into. And it's so personal. But another thing, um, bringing again into my orthopedic lens is talking about optimal positions during intercourse for you and your partner. Because for example, like for someone who has pain during intercourse, they may find that laying on their back with someone um, who perhaps has a penis and is trying to insert that penis into their vagina, if you're laying on your back with your knees really bent up towards your chest, that puts a lot of tension and stretch through your pelvic floor muscles versus if you are perhaps laying on your back with your legs out straight and relaxed. Um, your pelvic floor muscles are a lot more relaxed themselves, which means that as your as a penis or object vibrator, whatever it is, is being inserted, there's a lot more give in those muscles, and that oftentimes makes it more comfortable. Ah, there's so much more to talk about there, but we just don't have the time today. Um, okay, so a few myths. Um, to learn Kegels, I should try to stop the flow while urinating. Fun fact, this is actually like a special test we do. Um, you can, if you are, you know, on the toilet and you're going pee and you're able to like in the middle of a strong force of pee, if you're able to stop, that automatically tells you you've got like pretty good strength to your pelvic floor muscles. Um, that's telling you that you can close the door on the water coming in from the other room. That's awesome. I know what I tell people is that's great to know that you can do that. I do not recommend doing this as like a treatment for yourself um, because what it actually does is it kind of long-term it confuses your brain because what is meant to happen is our muscles are meant to be relaxed when we pee because um, we want the urethra to be open, right? Because when they're tight, it closes down. So um, if we are telling our brain, if our brain's thinking, I gotta go pee, I'm going pee, but wait, now I'm getting the signal that I'm contracting, the brain starts to get confused. I'm like, I don't understand what's happening. Uh, this is another fun fact of why um, it's actually recommended to sit on the toilet while you pee um, because just the natural art of squatting um, kind of contracts our pelvic floor muscles a little bit and it sends that conflicting information to our brain. Um, and then um, this is also why um, an extra a technique sometimes helping people control that strong urge to urinate would be learning how to do pelvic floor um, contractions and I call them like quick flicks. So it's a really quick short contraction and doing like 10 of them in a row sometimes can decrease the urge to go because um, complex thing here, um, but it's called Bradley's reflex loop. And what happens is again, you feel like you need to go pee. And if you do like 10, 20 quick flicks, your brain gets all that information back up. And it's like, oh, wait a second, but, I'm, but everything is closing down under the urethra and you can kind of override the system and then like decrease the urge to go. 
That doesn't work if your bladder really is super full and you need to go. But for people who are getting those urges and, the, and they go to the toilet and they're like, what the heck? I didn't really pee. Um, that sometimes can be really helpful. Um, second myth, Kegels will make my sex life better. Possibly, yeah, um, because I'm doing a pelvic floor contraction could strengthen that muscle ischiocarbonosis and other ones that pump blood up to the clitoris. But also, um, if you happen to be having pain during intercourse, you may find that doing pelvic floor contractions actually makes intercourse more painful. So again, finding a pelvic health PT, someone who can help you figure out where you're at that spectrum is really clutch here to figure out if they're appropriate for you and then what type of pelvic floor contractions are best for you. Um, Kegels will decrease my risk of tearing when I give birth. Um, I would say more so like your ability to, to, again, control your pelvic floor muscles, whether you're lifting them up or relaxing them is important. Innately, just doing Kegels over and over and over again can sometimes bring you to that spectrum of being kind of overactive pelvic floor muscles, tighter pelvic floor muscles, which could actually kind of close things down a little bit more during birth. And I do want to say, since I've mentioned tearing during birth quite a bit, it's a really low chance of people tearing. So even though we're talking about it, um, my intention is not to plant more fear around that because I know that's something that can um, weigh on a lot of the minds of folks who are pregnant. Okay, um, the vagina booth, I'm just, um, we tested this out. Unfortunately, the audio is not working, but I would so recommend all of you um, testing this out. I messaged it to Elizabeth earlier. So Elizabeth, maybe you could put it in the big chat for everyone, please. But it's just this short, thank you. It's a short like three minute video. And what it is, is, um, it goes through a few different, really, really brave women who have volunteered to stand in this booth tent, okay? And what they do is they give everyone a mirror, okay? And they ask them to take a look at their vulva and their vagina. And it's been the first time in their life. And they all go into like a little bit of info on why they've never done this before. And you get to see their reactions as they look at their vagina and vulva for the first time. And I just... I really recommend it because it's a very empowering video. Um, I have patients come back sometimes and tell me it brought them to tears watching it. And it just made them feel um, a lot more accepting of their own vulva and vagina. Oh, what a very um, in, empowering video to create. Um, so folks, I did add that in the chat box. And for those of you watching on Facebook, um, on the Marlene's page. I did add that in the um, uh, comment section. So definitely take a look at that resource. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate you. Um, so we're wrapping up here, folks, and we're about to get to question time. Um, just a couple more slides here. Um, I'd like to gift y'all with a, a couple more resources. So um, for folks who are experiencing um, pain during intercourse or pain um, inserting tampons or have never been able to use a tampon but have always wanted to, um, if, you, um, if you YouTube um, what it's like to not be able to have sex, there's this really great like short 10 minute animated film that does such a wonderful job of talking about some of the common symptoms of that and walks you through this um, you know, imaginary character of their experience of discovering pelvic health physical therapy and the positive impact it has on their life. Um, and I think it's a really relatable video for folks who are experiencing those symptoms. Um, and then two of my favorite pelvic health, we have specialists that you can follow on social media if you subscribe to social media. I'm Dr. Nelly and Dr. Mitchell. Their Instagram names are um, Vagina Rehab Doctor and My Pelvic Floor Muscles. I believe they also both have YouTube pages. Um, they just put out a ton of really wonderful product um, little short videos. There's just so much, so much education there. And I think that's one of the best things we can all do for ourselves is just to educate ourselves because that empowers us to understand our pelvic floors, um, what we're experiencing, and also through their, um, their social media platforms. It, I think it's empowering because they do such a good job of talking about how so many of these symptoms are so common. And oftentimes I think what exasperates pain or symptoms or embarrassment is that feeling of like you're alone in this and um, I cannot say enough how not alone any of us are in any symptoms that we're experiencing in the pelvic floor region. And then uh, lastly here, um, so I'm going to put my info on the next slide, but I put up this website www.pelvicrehab.com. I um, 
I think that it's so important to, if, if you are someone who's interested in pelvic health um, PT, to find a provider who you feel like has a personality that resonates with yours, because I think to really get optimal care, you want to be able to feel safe to be yourself. Um, ask those questions that you feel like you've always kind of wanted to ask or, or like never felt like you could ask and stuff. Um, and it's different than a gynecologist in my experience because um, working with someone maybe once or twice a week for several months, like that's a lot of time to spend with someone. So I just, I want to empower you to find someone you feel like you, res you really resonate with. And that does not have to be me. Okay, so that just brings me um, to uh, my information. You can find um, us at our website, which, which is right there. You can email us um, with questions or if you would like to set up an initial evaluation or a free consult. We've got our address here. Again, just a, a short drive down from Marlene. So, whew, I was talking fast, um, but it's 5.52, so we're only two minutes behind. Um, for anyone who has questions right now, I, I welcome them. But otherwise, um, thank you so much for everyone who tuned in tonight and for um, just, just being here. And I really, again, Elizabeth, appreciate this opportunity to talk about a topic that um, is, is very important to me. Thank you so much, Dr. Heron. I, I took a page and a half of notes myself. Um, <laughs> this is phenomenal information. And I know several of our customers have been um, requesting it over the years. So I I'm just so grateful that you're there in the local area providing this um, wonderful health resource to folks because pelvic floor health is very important. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're welcome. So we do have a few questions here. We have, um, I have level four prolapse out of my vagina of my rectum and recently my uterus as, as well. Can this be resolved with pelvic floor therapy alone? Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, so a, a stage four pelvic organ prolapse, um, for those who don't know what that refers to is when um, one or more of the pelvic organs have, have moved a little bit and kind of fallen into the vaginal canal to the point where they are exiting the opening of the vaginal canal. In my experience, um, something that can be uh, helpful is pelvic health PT. So what I, what I have learned is that someone, if you're having a stage four prolapse, um, there's what's more likely going to happen is learning how to, to live with it in the sense of getting tools to um, help you keep your pelvic organs more into your vaginal canal so they're protected and stuff. So you don't have to worry about like the pant irritation and stuff. I'm looking into um, things like seeing if a pessary, that's a little device, um, kind of like the sperm or silicone device often that can be fitted personally to you and then inserted into your vaginal canal. Um, I work often with um, Federal Way Naturopathy, which is a clinic where they have naturopaths who can fit you for those. So finding that can be helpful. And then in addition, um, learn, like taking a look, I would suspect that there's a good chance that your pelvic floor muscles are on the weaker side, maybe on the side of, of poor endurance and stuff. So that's definitely stuff we could look at with pelvic health PT. And then additionally, looking at if you have any um, symptoms of pain related to that, um, skin irritation, sometimes a lot of people who have that also experience um, urine leakage. And so frequent urine linkage um, in that area can kind of cause some redness and stuff. So th that's kind of the approach I give. Um, I wish I could say that this is something with pelvic health PT that we can get you back to a stage one, but I don't, I, I, I like to be honest with my patients and stuff. So the research tells us that's, um, there's, that's really not usually what happens, but a lot of people report that they feel a lot more improved quality of life when they get support of a pessary or just begin working with a pelvic health PT to learn how to manage that. Thank you for the question. For the excellent answer. So we had a few folks say thank you. Thank you very much. Love the clinic. Yay, Northwest Wellness, located in Federal Way. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also had a question about if my mouse will work. Come on, mouse. There we go. Um, what do you recommend for vaginal dryness during menopause? Mm, yes, that's such a good question. Um, so that's where I usually again refer people to um, 
Dr. D. Domenico over at Federal Way Naturopathy. They, I was just um, meeting with her last week, actually. And there are these little tablets. I don't prescribe medications, but they're these little tablets that you can insert into the vaginal canal um, that have like, um, can really help with some of the vaginal dryness. And then the other thing I recommend um, is getting yourself like a really good quality um, lubricant brand. If that is something, if you're just experiencing vaginal dryness that is giving you pain throughout the day, regardless of if you're participating in sexual intercourse, then I would say follow up um, with a, a gynecologist or uh, my preference personally is, is a naturopath. Um, but then additionally, like lubricant can be something that really reduces that those symptoms. A lot of people, whether you're in menopause or not, use lubricant and say it really improves the quality of their sex life. And my favorite brand that I recommend to patients is um, Good Clean Love. Good. Oh. Yes, and I, and I think we also sell that at Marlene's too. Yes, perfect. And wait, one more thing is also um, sometimes looking into um, getting like a blood panel just to see where your hormones are at. They, they do change during menopause, but um, there can also be different supplements and stuff that people can take that sometimes improve symptoms of vaginal dryness. Thank you. We had a few more questions. Let's see here. We had a few more thank yous. And um, is there something about the pelvic floor that would give one a vibrational feeling in the pelvic or vaginal area? Hmm, is this, that, that is a good question. Um, to fully answer it, I feel like a, a little bit more information would be helpful, but what I can say, I'd be curious if this is like a vibration feeling just like at rest and sitting or if it's during activities or during sexual intercourse and stuff. Um, Preliminarily, what I think of is um, depending on what well, you may it, may, it could be like a muscle spasm. Like if you're if you're on that that area of the spectrum where muscles are a little tighter and stuff, sometimes they can feel kind of like quivering and stuff. Um, kind of similar to like if you've ever had like a really hard workout and then like you tried to like walk upstairs afterwards or something and your legs just feel shaky. So th so that can be a cause if you've also done like. Um, a, uh, if you participate in a lot of sexual intercourse or just like done a big squat workout, those are things that can cause some fatigue in your pelvic floor muscles and give you that kind of um, like quivering feeling, which I think could be a, a vibra vibratory feeling. But that's something if you wanted to schedule a console, I'd be happy to speak with you a little bit more about. Wonderful, thank you. And then we have a few more thank yous and then um, would core exercises help with prolapse? Yes. So in the main sense, not to dec like if you have say stage three or stage two, core exercises alone aren't going to reduce the stage of the prolapse. But um, remember, increased intra-abdominal pressure. So like weight, like picking up something heavy. Um, if the pelvic floor muscles um, aren't doing their job per se, that can push. Um, like some people say there's nothing coming out of my vaginal canal, but then I picked up something heavy and then I felt like a dropping feeling in my vagina. So if you can engage your core muscles more so that then you can um, avoid those, like increase, you can manage that increased intra-abdominal pressure, it'll put less stress through your pelvic organs. Um, so they can also, in that way, it can also help prevent a um, worsening of your pelvic organ prolapse, say like if you have a stage one or stage two and that progressing to a stage three or a stage four. Ooh, though I would say specific core muscle, uh, core workouts, so like crunches um, and sit-ups are more things you would want to avoid, but working with like a PT to learn about muscles to, or exercises to strengthen like your transverse abdominis is more the track you'd want to go down. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have a few more questions. I love all these questions. Wow, this is fantastic. Yes. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here and all these fabulous questions. Um, so this attendee said, I have a friend who has also, oops, uh, also had a hysterectomy and she's struggling with um, inserting during sex when she feels it's shortened. Hmm. Oh, where, where she feels it's shortened. Uh, and then um, kind of a next question is a uh, uh, prolapse has also been a topic of my friends and relatives. Um, thank you so much for all the great info here tonight. 
Oh, yes, you're welcome. Okay, great. And then back to the other questions. So, um, yes, definitely something we could go into more with like a, a full evaluation, but preliminarily. So what I think about is usually that sounds like pain with like deep thrust and stuff. So um, considering the position that you're in for intercourse, um, like usually, for example, if you're the person with the vagina and you're on top, um, that can be more, more painful feeling like, like deep penetration. Um, sometimes uh, participating in sexual intercourse in like a quadruped position, so on your hands and knees or like doggy style, um, can reduce some of that like deep pain with deep thrust. And then another thing that's tool, cool, excuse me, is this, um, this is called the O-Nut and um, you can get that online, relatively inexpensive. What it looks like, it's like this little donut. It's really stretchy. Um, and what you do um, is this is something that you can insert onto the shaft of a penis. So you use lubricant first, you put lubricant on the inside and then you put it over the, sh the tip of the penis and you roll it all the way down to the base here. And you can take um, one, you can put two, you can put three, you can put four on as many as you need. And what this does is essentially acts as like a gentle stopper to the vaginal canal. And the if you go to their website, the reviews on this are really good um, in s saying that um, it really reduces the pain with deep penetration, that it's also really pleasurable for the partner who is the owner of the penis. That's neat a product. I had no idea that they had come out with that but that's that's great because then that way um you know they're able to still engage with um in a coitus yes yep yes. yep um and then also we had another question um let's see um oh goodness my chat box is just I couldn't scroll okay there we go it would be awesome if you to do another Zoom meeting regarding uh, pelvic floor prolapse. Okay, I can Woo, request. Steve, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I know it is really hard to decide what to talk about today. I know this is a it's a a condition that impacts so many people um so personally. Well, for sure, and I I just want to thank each and every one of our attendees and yourself, Dr. Heron, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us. Um, what an amazing, we had, we had um, over 25 people here and that, that is amazing. So thanks for making this a huge success folks. And also Dr. Heron for having fabulous information. Well, you are welcome. My pleasure, everyone. Yay. Oh, and we have a few more questions. So um, they said, thank you. Thank you for the info and very friendly um, atmosphere. I will definitely come to see you at your clinic. Yay. Oh, that's, what a compliment. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. And then we had another attendee say uh, great info on the O-Nut. O-Nut. Yes. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, um, if anyone has... Um, uh, no more questions. I'm going to uh, turn off the Facebook Live. So let's say goodbye to all of our Facebook Live friends. Bye-bye. And thanks for tuning in.